Hello everybody and welcome back to Real Movie Talk. This is the show where we talk everything films and the industry that surrounds them. I am your host Deck, and with me as always is Ben. Welcome to the podcast. And in today's video, given the fact that we don't have any new movies to talk about and there isn't as much news to discuss, we're going to be doing something a little bit different and in this case it's going to be our top 5 A24 films. Uh, we have both put together our own individual uh, A24 list of our top 5 films from the studio. Uh, we've also not told each other our lists so we don't know uh, what each other's have, what each other has put so uh, it's going to be a bit of a reveal for the both of us. Um, so I guess we could just jump straight into it. Um, we kind of discussed off camera as well you know that we didn't really have much trouble putting together our f top five list it's kind of uh it's quite easy i think for the both of us even though there were some that we wanted to shout out do you want to shout out a couple yeah so um i really wanted to put films like the witch and the farewell then a little bit less so but like i really love these films um we have high life under the silver lake and amy i really wanted to put the witch in though yeah it, it was quite close for you i know um and then for me, I, I would like to shout out Good Time, the first film, well, it's not the first film from the Safdie Brothers, but another film from the Safdies, I, I thought was a really strong film. And also The Florida Project, I absolutely adored. It was so close to being my number five, but wasn't. I just lost out to another film. But um, yeah, we'll just jump straight into the list. So you can start off with your number five. Right, so my number five is First Reformed. So this is starring Ethan Hawke and directed by Paul Schrader, who wrote taxi driver raging bull i mean what can you ask for this guy is the best and first reformed first time i watched it it really affected me and i didn't actually like it that much because i thought i just really took harshly to it like enjoyed it i really liked how it was but it was too affecting to me and that was just the first time then i revisited it a few months later and i realized this is such a good film and I just really had a new appreciation for it. And that doesn't normally happen that much. I normally really like a film and then I love it even more just continually just rewatching. But for First Reformed, I had this very strong reaction against it. And then I just realized how, how great it is. And, so you know, it's a tale of a New York pastor who works at a First Reformed church. And this is obviously played by Ethan Hawke. He, taller and i really think this film works because it's this tale of loss you know faith loss of faith and this guilt and you know, it of links into all the um major themes that we have going on in real life to do with like the environment and everything basically it's a lot of despair and a lot of angst about what's happening out in the world and I think this is just truly affecting and it really really is one of the best written films in recent years and one of the best directed films one thing that i loved the most about the film was paul schrader's direction because honestly he works so well with his cinematographer every shot seems to be calculated and every shot is so controlled and i think sign of a great director in this case was definitely like you could tell the whole time he's in full control but at the end right so you have all these shots they're most literally all static i don't remember maybe there was a few ones where he's just tracking or something but anyway so they're all you know still or just tracking then you have the one big moment where the camera moves around and that no that was just a sign to me that you know how much I appreciated how this film was directed and so I think it's really one of the best directed films in recent years and it's one of my favorite and Ethan Hawke man he should have I, I would say he should have won the Oscar probably for that year uh, if if not like um, Foster and Leave No Trace but Ethan Hawke and this guy kills it and this film just really affected me and I thought it was fantastic. Yeah I've seen a lot of people talk about this I nearly watched it myself when it came out on Blu-ray but I haven't actually got around to it yet. Uh, but it does look very good, very interesting. Uh, my number five, um, I was going to guess this was on your list, but you kind of already told me this one's on your list. Uh, my number five is The Lighthouse. Um, God, this film is great. Um, I remember going into it, and I, I really enjoyed The Witch. I watched The Witch, I think, a week before I, I, I saw The Lighthouse, um, and I was instantly impressed by that. That film was just so intriguing and kind of gross at times, especially the score, which was harrowing. Uh, but going into the lighthouse, I was very excited just because it looked so 
unique the idea of you know the film being shot in uh in the specific aspect ratio i'm not technically minded as you can tell um <laughs> but you know that that small aspect ratio i don't know the numbers um but also just coming back to these performances like robert pattinson was just off the wall in the movie so was willem dafoe both of them probably the biggest snubs of the oscars last year how neither of them got any recognition at all is beyond me uh, especially willem dafoe like just insane um having the movie in black and white just made it feel so much darker and so much more gritty uh which i really enjoyed uh, also the sound design of the film was kind of insane especially when it comes to that constant foghorn of the lighthouse itself just being constant throughout the movie like anytime i hear that now my spine kind of just shivers mm -hmm. <laughs> like even in real life if i just hear that kind of go off it just sends me freaks me out and this movie did that because it makes that noise go from something that's kind of average and just an everyday thing into just this noise of just being terrified um so the lighthouse for me just had so much going on with it even though i've only seen the film once and i've honestly just not stopped thinking about it ever since um there's so many memorable shots that just kind of get engraved into your mind uh, and even though i think there are deeper elements of the film that i personally haven't quite fully come to grips with yet um, particularly to do with some certain symbolism that appears to be with certain mythology. Um, I just think the film on a surface level is just so engaging and so entertaining and just the mystery of it and just being along for that ride is a wild one. And I just, you know, I went to a specialist cinema because this film was being shown nowhere around here where I live. So I had to travel out a bit to go see it in the cinema. And I'm so glad I did. Like going to that experience just further added to it. And I just... I love the lighthouse. I was so obsessed with it when I came out. Yeah, fantastic choice. I'm not going to comment on that yet. Anyway, <laughs> my number four pick is, <clears throat> and I think my top four, my top five, all so similar. We could literally interchange day by day. But I would say number four is Midsummer as of right now. And so Midsummer is the second film from Ari Aster. And this amazing i rewatched it a few days ago like a week ago or something and man this film especially the first time i watched it and all the times i watched it in the cinema i watched it four times in the cinema i was obsessed with this film and the first time i watched it i remember just coming out of the screening going what the fuck did i just watch <laughs> actually obviously it's a bit different when you watch it at home i can tell but seriously watching this film in the cinema was like like nothing else basically and i think this is a fantastic film and it has this amazing wizard of oz like feel to it you know you, you know you're stepping into this whole new world and i think you know, it's just so affecting like first reformed and like a lot of these films on my list really really did affect me i wasn't like horrified or anything like that but that, i don't think he's trying to make it into a horror i think it's this psychological tale that gets right under your skin. It's disturbing. It's sort of mythic and it's intricate with its use of symbolism. You get all of that all packed into one film. And I think Ari Aster really has a talent for the detail and for everything seen. It sort of reminded me of, like, say, a Kubrick film. Because he does have that sort of control that Kubrick does have. And I think Ari Aster is one of the best directors working today if not the best and so you know there is just some amazing stuff Prince P is amazing the whole cast is amazing cinematography is gorgeous and it really gets under your skin it's very malevolent and i think this just proves ariasta to be you know like an upcoming like master honestly because i was just fully induced into this nightmare of vision and yeah i really really love midsummer i think it's amazing yeah it is a great choice and i'm uh, not going to comment on that much either because it will appear later on <laughs> um my number four apologies ben is uncut gems um for me uncut gems was a surprise because going into it i had just seen good time about a week or so beforehand um and I loved Good Time. I really enjoyed it. I thought that film was fantastic. Going into Uncut Gems, I thought it could go either way. Like, it could be better. It could be worse. I heard fantastic things, and I heard some not-so-great things from this fella. And um, 
I was I was very interested to see my, my own thoughts. Um, I mean, initially, straight off the bat, like I think the first thing that instantly comes to mind is Adam Sandler and his performance, which obviously Adam Sandler, like it's so obvious to talk about. Obviously, he does all these typical comedy films, studio comedies, and it just proves in Uncut Gems that if he actually wants to act, he can. Um because he's fantastic in this, and I genuinely believe this was an Oscar-worthy performance completely. Um, I loved his, you know, his win at the Indie Spirits. I think he completely deserved that um, because his performance is just insane and electric and just relentless in this film. Um, I just I loved his character as well because his character could be well, his character is unlikable as hell, but I think having someone like Adam Sandler in the role just adds a sense of likability to him and you almost want to just root for him in some way so when he's making all these awful and horrible decisions you're not really annoyed at him you more feel almost sorry for him in a way even though he is completely doing it by himself you know it's it's all his own fault you almost kind of it's almost endearing in a way um and on top of that the safety style works so well for this film being really up close and personal putting you in the shoes of the characters really putting you in these scenes in these situations um, and the colours, the lighting, again, kind of signature for the Safdies, their style, um, the neon and electricity throughout is just, it, it kind of just really ramps up your senses, um, and I just loved all that stuff, the intensity in the film, even though I didn't feel it as much as some people, I don't know if this is a personal thing, again, I was talking to a friend about this, I don't know if this is, like, a personal thing, that's just me, I didn't really feel stressed watching the movie, um, and a lot of people talk about how this film is like super stressful and you know you'll be like sweating and you know relieved by the time the movies end i wasn't really like that really i i still absolutely loved the film and i thought it was great and i had a fantastic time watching it and i completely get the stakes behind the film particularly in the last act but i can't say i ever felt stressed and i, I don't know if that's just me i don't know if that's a thing that maybe i'm maybe i'm devoid of emotion in comparison to most people but i just couldn't I just didn't feel stressed throughout it, which is a bit of a weird thing. But that's not to take away from the movie at all. Because, again, I still completely felt the stakes in that last act. And I was completely enthralled throughout the entire thing. Um, and I just had a blast with it. And I'm actually I'm gonna, I'm planning to watch it again soon. I do want to watch it again soon. Because I want to see, now I know the film and how it ends, I want to see how it holds up on a rewatch. So, for me, Uncut Gems, I like it more than Good Time. And it's definitely my favourite Safdies movie that I've seen. I do want to go back and check out some of the films of theirs. Um, but I, I really enjoyed Uncut Gems a lot, unlike this guy on the other side. Yeah, I, yeah, I did not like it. Did you feel stressed watching it? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> anyway, my, I, a lot of people would do that. I thought that, that would be higher on your list, to be honest. Yeah, I've got, to be honest... It, it honestly could be like the the top four are kind of pretty close but it's just yeah. that's where that's where it feels right same. same um so my number three pick is the lighthouse so you mentioned this already um i love the witch as i've mentioned i've watched it many times it really gets into my skin i watched it in the cinema recently before the cinema's shut i was supposed to see it again but then the cinema shut just right as the screening was about to happen a few days <laughs> before which is a shame, but anyway, so The Lighthouse is from Robert, Robert Eggers, um, who did The Witch, and this is his second film, and I think like Ari Aster, and like another director who I'm going to talk about in a minute, I think he's one of the best directors working today. Um, there's just a few people, I'll get to the other person in a minute, but they just, I don't know how they're this good, like in the second film. I think he he's like Ari Aster, he's got this sensibility to him he has this absolute sense of control that you know echoes something like you know kubrick i've said this the control of riasta and robert eggers in both of their films in both of their two films it's just incredible i just can't comprehend how great these films are honestly so lighthouse is this kind of utterly like dark and utterly wild tale at Parks back obviously to all these mythical um I was in the past. Mainly the one that um, reached out to me was the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It's a it's a poem we had to study it in school, but it's really similar. It's about this um about this mariner, this uh, guy who goes around on boats, that's what a mariner is. And he kills an albatross, so he kills he kills a bird and 
no, then they become cursed. He becomes cursed. And so in the lighthouse, you have this curse after he kills the seagull. Very similar. I love sort of um love the way he researches his films and worlds feel so complete and you are utterly absorbed into everything and he's able to capture some really deeply disturbing imagery with the use of symbolism as well as referencing but also repetition repetition is a thing that i think he does really well he creates this um sort of sense within you where no, anything could happen. You're right on the edge of your seat the whole time. It's not a horror, but there are parts that evoke a sense of horror throughout. And I think it's similar to Midsummer, but I would say it's more scary than Midsummer because I would say it's it's not it's more psychological than strictly a horror, and it's more you know lit, uh, literary than just uh, any other film. And basically, I could talk about this all day. I'm rambling, but. You know, there is definite there is definite influence from you know I don't know if you've seen it Declan but like the films of the German es- expressionist movement you know with the darks and lights with the film noir aesthetic oh you know everything is shot in this boxy ratio this box light ratio that really adds to this sense of ongoing tension but also the fact that you're isolated you're stuck with these guys. And I think the way it's directed is fantastic. I think it was one of the best directed films last year and one of the best active films as well. And one of the best looking films happily, amazingly, it got nominated for an Oscar for the cinematography, which was a joy to see. Yeah. And so Defoe and Pattinson, it delivered these sort of sledgehammer performances where they go all the way. They don't stop. And you never one second even question anything about this like is this stage or anything no this is absolute reality in this sort of crazy vision of you know Mar- like mariner times like way back when whenever it's set so i think it's one of the best achievements last year it was easily one of the best films and it's this sort of unstoppable force of darkness and confinement which obviously is very um what would you say is it's very um it's, it's very cool. apparent with the, cool. yeah with, with, with what's the... happening right now yeah yeah <laughs> it's true because like timely, what honest. happened timely that's the word what happens if we are stuck in like we are right now would we go crazy like these people <laughs> have to wait and see uh yeah i can't stop thinking about this film and you know, i watched it like three times i think in the cinema and this Im- and the impact of the film remains to this day and i look back upon it really fondly and i want to revisit it really soon it's fantastic yeah and it's it's great that you brought up the cinematography because like what's kind of interesting is obviously it did get a nomination this year which was great it totally should have won um and even yeah. that's a lot for me to say given the fact that i adore roger deakins i he's literally one of my favorite people in hollywood i just love him and you know i've been just been begging and begging him for him to win and obviously he got his blade runner win which was amazing and even though i thought the cinematography in 1917 was good it was decent um but it didn't do what the lighthouse did and it was the yeah. one time where i was like i'm sorry roger you shouldn't win this year <laughs> this isn't me your too. time that's me too because i love roger deakins but then yeah. i would have put um Once upon a time and the lighthouse over 1917 yeah i i just think 1917 i <laughs> i don't want to get into 1917 this isn't like a the video for that but yeah it's just i i do feel like that film has got a lot of uh issues especially when it comes to the cinematography um but my number three and you've already mentioned this is midsummer um this was almost number two but i've actually swatched i've actually swapped my number two and three around um because my number two which i'll get to i actually rewatched uh very recently um but midsummer was fantastic like i watched Oh no, I actually, I think I watched Hereditary, did I watch it after? I think I've actually watched Hereditary after Midsummer. But I was very much aware of Hereditary going in. And what fascinated me most about Midsummer was the idea of Ari Aster doing a horror film in broad daylight. That hadn't really, that isn't really something I had seen before. It was something that I thought was really interesting, especially because this movie is so bright. It's almost like overwhelmingly bright. Um, especially when I watched it in the cinema, I watched it, I didn't watch it in my normal cinema, I watched it somewhere else on this huge screen, and, like, 
the overwhelming amount of brightness that was coming out really added to the experience, really, of just being blinded by it all. Like, the idea of going to this cult fairy tale kind of land. Um, you know, I love the line where they mention, you know, oh, it's 9 p.m., it can't be 9 p.m., look at the sky. Um, can't be right the sky is yeah, blue <laughs> exactly and i was like like i thought that was great like it just it adds so much to this idea of this being like a you know ariasta does refer to this as like a twisted fairy tale and that land of it it seems very very real and i, I was very impressed with all that and this also just kind of just cemented my love for florence Pugh. i was already really on her hype train by this point but this movie just secured it um i think she should have been nominated for best actress probably could have yeah. won honestly um especially i mean I, I did watch judy and i thought that renee zellweger was good in that role but for me florence in this film is just on another level i had not seen a performance like it because it's the way she cries in this movie in particular I, mm -hmm. It's the most realistic cry I have ever seen and, like, realistic display of grief I have ever seen in film. It was insane. Because um, it, it was just... It was so uncomfortable to watch. I was like, this is just... I shouldn't be looking at this. Um, and that's how good it was. But my favourite thing about Midsummer overall is something that I kind of did an essay-style video on, which is everything that happens in this movie... And this is actually why I didn't like Hereditary as much, is that... Everything that happens in this movie could happen in real life. In yeah. the sense that there is no supernatural elements in this movie. There's none of that. Which, is, again, this is why with Hereditary, I really enjoyed Hereditary right up until the final moments. Because I was like, even though I still like the movie overall, I was like, I was kind of underwhelmed by the ending. With Midsummer, I absolutely adore how just, it's just horror and reality. Like, everything in this movie that can happen in real life. And that adds so much more of a horror factor to it for me personally. Like, seeing these people do these certain things and, you know, when you see that the elderly couple who get thrown off the top of that cliff yeah. and stuff like that, and you just see the the harsh reaction of the splat on the ground. Or, to be honest, the scariest moment in the movie for me is where you just hear about, the, at the very beginning, where Florence's character, Danny, gets a text from her sister saying, you know, mum and dad are coming with me now. And you just see that really long tracking shot that goes through the garage into the car, follows up the stairs, and you just see the parents dead because they had been gassed, you know, through the fumes from the car. That was terrifying for me. Absolutely terrifying. Like, that is by far the scariest thing in the movie for me. Um, yeah. And I think that comes down to the filmmaking as well, again, with that long tracking shot, the, the build to it. But it's just the way everything in this film is so realistic to the point where everything that happens is is real. It just makes it that much more scary for me. Um, so for me, Midsummer completely stood out as a horror film, even though, again, as you said, it's not as much of a horror film as some others traditionally. Um, I do feel like this film has a specific area of horror that it covers, and it was very new, very unique, very fresh, and I was just enthralled from scene one to the end. Yeah, fantastic pick. Um, I love Midsummer. And that's true. The start is just so impactful, especially the first time I watched it in the cinema. The crying and with, you know, the slow way that he pushes around the house and you yeah. get to see all the things. I was like, holy shit. And then I love, love when the title cards come up. I think they're probably the best title cards last year. Yeah. It goes through the window. It starts snowing. And then you hear the, the score kick in. You're like, oh, fuck. Yeah. What am I in for? <laughs> yeah, so... I love Midsummer. Honestly, like I said, top five, it all switch around day by day, depending on what I've watched recently. Okay, so number two for me is Lady Bird. So I love Lady Bird. That was my favorite film of 2017 uh, in joint joint picked with Blade Runner 2049, of course. Obviously. Obviously. And so Lady Bird was Greta Gerwig's first film. I'm a massive Greta Gerwig fan. I think some other films that she does Noah Baumbach or just Noah Baumbach or just Greta Gerwig. There's just something about it. I think me, it's just really, really personal. And yes, I can't, you know, I don't relate in the way that I was a girl going through high school in America, in Sacramento. There is something about the way that Greta Gerwig makes her films touch me so deeply. And this was the reason, this was the film that made me want to doing filmmaking and pursue doing film reviews and such 
I don't know what it was, but there was just something about the film really, really called out to me. And I think Tagoe does a fantastic job with this. It's a coming of age story like no other. I think it's probably the best one. And most directors don't have such perfect films. And this was the other person that I wanted to mention. I think, you know, you have Ari Aster, you have Robert Eggers. I think you have Jennifer Kent, who did uh, The Babadook and The Nightingale. And then I think you have Greta Gerwig as well. These directors have only made two films. They're all fantastic and they're not as good or better than some of the established directors work in today. And so I think Lady Bird just truly shines on all fronts. It's beautiful to look at. The colours are fantastic. They shine through, showing the dark and light sides of life in Sacramento. And it has fantastic performances, namely Saoirse Ronan, who is one of the best actors working today, male or female. She is just fantastic. And I think this is a joint best role. I think her other best role is in Greta Gerwig's other film, Little Women, which is just as good. I, I really can't decide which film I like more. But anyway, so Lady Bird really, really does shine through with the direction and the way it's directed and the way it's written just something about it that really really called out to me and it touched me in a way that most films aren't able to do and i think that's a combination of all the elements and you know it's sort of reality it feels like reality you don't question it then there is a sort of style to this reality that i think greta Gerwig really captures in both of her films but especially Lady Bird. so that's why it's my number two pick yeah it's a good choice uh, i actually have a bit of a hot take when it comes to Lady Bird. Like, I think it's great, and I, I, I did enjoy it. Uh, but I, I did feel it was a tad overrated. But that's just me personally. Mm -hmm. um, my number two, this one is a very personal pick. Well, actually, to be honest, my number two and my number one are both personal picks. Um, but number two, I watched this uh, this week, or was it? I think it might have been on the weekend. Um, but my number two is Eighth Grade. Um, this film was just insane to me. This is directed by Bo Burnham, who obviously comes from a very strong comedic background. And this film is hilarious. Um, just in the way it plays on high school life and how realistic it is. And even though there is a slight disconnect between me and this film as, you know, British society and American society is very different. Um, so there are some aspects that, you know, I can't really say were super authentic because, again, I didn't experience it. There are still some other elements where it was just so on point. Like this movie, that's the way to describe this movie. It's on point in every way. Um, Elsie Fisher in the lead role as Kayla, just such a breakout role. Like I can't wait to see where she goes from here, especially because she's so young. Like she has got such a bright career ahead of her. Uh, and the fact that she was just able to carry this movie on her shoulders at such a young age is super impressive. Um, Bo Burnham's directional style, where he just is able to just really get into like the nitty gritty of high school while keeping it light and fun. Because um, I think this movie very easily could have gone down the route of being a bit more serious and could have perhaps taken a darker turn at some points. I like how the film keeps itself light and breezy. And it's, you know, the movie's only an hour and a half. It flies by. Um, it's so intelligently written and I just love how all the characters interact because they do act like kids that's the thing that, and that's because the cast in this movie are kids and it just feels so real and believable and the, the thing that I love most about this film is that the character of Kayla she is a YouTuber <laughs> you know, she makes these online videos and things like that and the way she records them is the most dead on accurate impression of a youtuber starting out at a young age i've ever seen because i've done youtube for about ugh, going on seven years now and when i first started doing it oh god it's so it's so accurate <laughs> it's so it, true it's the way she speaks like have you seen this movie no but i know i know what happens and yeah. i've seen clips yeah the way she speaks because she doesn't speak with any sentence structure or any kind of flow it's just she speaks like this she goes you know it's like uh it's like uh you know here and uh, <laughs> like the way she's that's so accurate because you can't when you're that age doing these videos and you're you don't know what to say so you're sat there going oh you know it's like this and uh you know and uh the way that she was able to portray that i remember watching this in the cinema and just laughing because i was like i cannot believe 
you know, and I don't want to be that person who's like, oh, this movie was just like so me and so, you know, but it really felt like that. Like it really felt like this movie had always like taken a look at some of my really old content on YouTube that definitely does not <laughs> exist anymore and just kind of reflected it on the screen. I was just floored by it. Just the accuracy. Um, and like I say, the way I describe this movie, it's, it's, it's on point. It's so on point on every aspect. And I loved it again. The rewatch that I did recently, I, I forgot how much I loved it. Like I forgot how much I love this movie. Um, it's just truly fantastic and this is just one I can see myself just going back to time and time again uh, and I, I love it so much oh yeah that's uh, a thing I have a few confessions like I've not seen some of the most acclaimed A24 films like I haven't seen Moonlight or I haven't seen 8th Grade and I haven't seen The Florida Project so I really do need to get around to seeing them because I know people love them so much and I've got a feeling I'm going to love them yeah. Um, so that's like a thing that I don't like to say to everyone, but it's true. Yeah. I, I haven't seen everyone. Great. I think you'll love the Florida Project as well. I've seen Moonlight, which I'm not as hot on, but yeah, I think those two in particular you'll you'll really enjoy. Yeah, and so I would say my number one, and like I said, this is all interchangeable. I think First Reform, Midsummer, The Lighthouse, Ladybird, any of them could be number one on a given day. My number one is hereditary and i really really affected by hereditary i remember seeing it this was like uh what so it came out in 2018 i watched it at the london sundance film festival where they show some of the sundance stuff that would have been around june slash may time here in 2018 i first started getting into films properly i would say around early 2017 late 2016 right so this hit me at the peak of my point where I was full on into it, right? At the time of Oscar season 2017, that's when I was into it and Hereditary hit right at the right time. And I was fully into horror and everything like that. And especially psychological horror for me. That's why I love the aspects of The Lighthouse and Midsummer and The Witch so much because I really think they do a fantastic job at getting under your skin. You know, best thing in horror is when films get under your skin make you tense make you shit yourself basically <laughs> is what is so great about psychological horrors for me prefer that to getting jump scared even though yeah. I do get jump scared not saying i don't get jump scared i like some films like that but this predatory was something else and it really was a revelation when i watched it i was scared shitless i'm not gonna lie i was uh in the picture house you've been to the picture house with yeah, me yeah and Okay, in screen number one where it was, chairs move back, right? You can lean back on them and yeah. they move back. And that's not a good idea for a horror film, right? <laughs> when you're getting <clears throat> when you're you're getting shit scared. And I had to like just sit forward the whole time so I didn't go, Whoa shit. Yeah, yeah. Disturb everyone. So um I watched the film and I was just I was just shocked the whole time. I was just getting scared left, right, and center. I thought it was so good. I was admiring the filmmaking and anything that maybe I watched that year. Seriously, um, Ari Aster, this was his first film. I think it's a perfectly made film. I can't see any flaws in it. And just the way it's directed and everything is set up so perfectly. And this goes along with Midsummer. I think Predatory has something else to it. I don't know what. I can't pin it down, but I would say Hereditary is the one. However, this control is shown in this film, and if you've seen the short films already, this guy, you know what is coming from him. You know you're going to get great stuff. Anyway, so this film centers around this conspiracy to do with the grandma. She dies, and then some strange stuff starts to happen. Then it gets a bit more twisted as signs go along. As things go along, then you get all these little signs forewarning us about the horror that is to come and once it gets to you know, it's very realistic the whole time like you said however um i think that comes down to the writing and the acting and i think the style of the film really aids to that you know presence of reality and also people didn't like the ending i don't think you like the ending right it's not that i didn't like the ending i just found it a bit underwhelming Right. Well, for me, I love the ending and I love how it goes into that realm of the supernatural because the whole time you're like, okay, this could be real. This could be fake this whole time. Then when it really hits for me, 
that ending when Annie becomes possessed and when she is on the ceiling, when she is cutting her oh throat and the ending when she floats up truly got under my skin that whole last sort of segment of the film. I was so shocked and I was basically speechless after this film. And so I think one element that it caught was, you know, the signals of this film. And, you know, when you go back and look at the film, you can see all the these sort of subtle things that have been put in there. Maybe you've noticed it in your subconscious and at the end of the film you're like oh shit that was to do with that and i think that comes down to how good ariaster is and how precise he is similar to like i've been saying robert eggers i think those guys are kind of similar wavelength even though the films are very different i think the way they approach their films are kind of similar and so hereditary is without without a doubt one of the best horror films of all time i really really adore it and it just affected me so much i was scared out of my mind in this and i just you know I, I i can give all the praise in the world to ari Aster. yeah so that's my number one yeah it's a good choice it's a good choice i mean like i say i don't love the ending of hereditary but it's still a fantastic film and i was also affected by it like as you mentioned the scene where tony collette is there cutting her neck at the end is just yeah. it, it's i was just like I, I almost like it's like a car crash i just had to keep looking at it <clears throat> and you know, the, the it's kind of going back to my points with uncut gems. Uh, this movie stressed me out. Where yeah. the scene, you know, where they go to the party, and then eventually, um, you know, obviously we have the scene in the car going back home. That was stressful, and the way obviously that kind of comes to an ultimate crescendo with the head coming clean off. Oh my god! Like that was insane, literally insane. Especially because. At, at, based on everything I knew about Hereditary at that point before watching the film, I thought that the uh, young girl in the movie was going to be a big, big part of it. For her to get killed off that early on, I did not expect. Um, so not only was it a shock, but it was also, like, disgusting. Um, so yeah, Hereditary yeah. Is, is a great is a great top pick. Um, my number one, again, this is a personal pick, and when they said they were going to be making this movie, I couldn't believe it. Like, And when I watched it, it was everything I wanted and more. Um, my number one is the disaster artist. Um, for me, the room is just one of the most fascinating things on the planet to like ever be created. I think it's so interesting and engaging. I've, I've read so much about the room. I've watched so much about it behind the scenes, just trying to piece together Tommy Wiseau as a person, as a creative mind, because the way he just carries himself is just unlike anyone else. He's almost not human. If he comes out and says he's an alien, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and the room is just a fascinating creation. It's you know it's often referred to as the best worst movie of all time. Uh, I've seen it countless number of times. Um, it's just a genuinely enthralling experience to watch. So when they said that they were going to be adapting Greg Sestero's book about the film, I was just so excited. And this movie is just perfect. Um, and it was also surprising. This movie had so much more depth than what I was expecting. Um, I thought this film was going to be purely just this comedy that was going to focus on all the in-jokes of the room and, you know, for all the fans of the room to really get behind and enjoy and just appreciate. But what I didn't expect was this movie to actually be a movie. And this film tells this really emotional and heartfelt story about trying to make it in Hollywood. And, and this guy who, you know poured his heart and soul into this film uh, and it almost makes you look at the room in a different way um you look at it typically as just being you know this absolute trash piece of cinema that's so enjoyable because of how bad it is but then after watching this film and just you know looking at it from this perspective you kind of realize that this film was meant to be something um tommy had a vision for this at least no one really knows or understands what that vision necessarily was but there was there was something there um and just because of the way he was and the way he is he's just this different mind that no one really understands and no one could really get behind his vision and he just becomes more and more frustrated as the film goes on uh while trying to get this movie made um and it's incredibly heartfelt like seeing these two people just come together to make this film and the journey they go on the way they bond um and just having this ever-looming mystery about the main character, Tommy, and 
you know, where he comes from, what he aspires to do. And it, it, it's, it's never really fully explained. And even to this day, people don't know really where Tommy Wiseau came from or who he is, really. I, I don't even think his name is Tommy Wiseau. I think his name could be something else. <laughs> um, and at the same time, while this film it still is that really strong story, it also does keep the comedy there. It's still hilarious. The film, you know, does poke fun at the room it does have all those in jokes and if you are you know kind of in that community in a way of you know just being a fan of the room you will just love everything the film does for it and performance wise james franco is such brilliant casting as tommy the way he plays it is just dead on um i was so impressed with how he was just able to like embody him like his mannerisms the way he speaks the crazy accent um the laugh which he absolutely nails he just really gets all the best little bits of tommy and just brings it into his performance and even uh you know dave franco who plays greg as well was another great piece of casting and everyone really is perfectly cast even down to like zach efron who's in the movie as the character of chris r in the movie of the room um was, was brilliant and seth rogan who kind of plays the director in the dop for the movie is really hilarious I just loved everything about it. Like I say, I thought this movie was going to be one thing. It ended up being something else. So it was everything I wanted and more. Um, so it is a personal pick just because, again, I adore The Room and therefore I adore this film. Uh, but it genuinely shocked me as to how good it actually ended up being. Yeah, and that's another one that I haven't watched. That is um, like those other three I mentioned. Oh, I really got to get on that because loads of people love it. Yeah, it's it's kind of insane, and I also think as well, uh, just as like an additional point, as I mentioned, like this movie is more than just a poking fun at the room for for an hour and a half. So like, I think if you even if you don't know the room and you don't know the in jokes, I still think you can appreciate the film, um, because it does tell a separate story from that. So even if like I don't, have you seen the room? <laughs> I just can't get myself to watch it. <laughs> oh, you need to, man! It's so good. But um, even if you've not watched it, I still think you can you can watch the Disaster Artist and just enjoy it. Like for example, like my, my dad actually saw the movie with me, and he's he knows nothing about the room, uh, but he he really enjoyed it. So I I think that you just gotta kind of even if you don't want to watch the room, if you still can't bring yourself to watch it, you can still check this out, and you know you can enjoy it for what it is. And then even if you if you do see the room beforehand, it just adds even more to it. So yeah. Uh, but there you go. There is our top five A24 films. Uh, make sure you leave your personal top 25, top 25, top five list uh, in, in the comment section down below. Which one are your favorites? And how do you feel about our lists? Let's have a good discussion about that in the comments down below. Um, and also just shout out any other mentions that you have as well. Of course, we did our own special shout outs as well. Make sure you do the same. Um, this was a fun, this was a fun list actually. I think going forward for this podcast, we should start looking at doing some more things like this, especially yeah. in this sort of time at the moment where we haven't really got much else to be doing. Um, so if you guys have any suggestions for that, let us know in the comments down below, uh, you know, for rankings and things like that, anything interesting, just throw it in the comments down below, uh, and I'll chat with you guys about it. But, um, anyway, with all that said, uh, I've been deck then, and we hope to see you guys again in the next episode.